This week we turn to feminist political economy. So far we've looked at classical political economy, Marxian political economy, neoclassical political economy, institutional political economy, and now we turn to feminist political economy. In each case, we've seen the economic thinkers mapping out the problems that they were trying to respond to in their own periods. In this week, we extend uh, the problem to a new one that builds out of institutional political economy and has links to Marxian political economy. In a sense, feminist econ economics takes the class analysis that we saw in Marxian political economy one step further. It says, yes, workers are exploited by capital. We need an analysis that takes class seriously, um, asking why it is that um, capitalists get always get a bigger share of the pie than workers. Um, but feminist economics and feminist economists also then ask, well, why is it that carers, usually women, those who do the domestic work, the labour, why is it that they get very little? Why is it that their labour is deemed unproductive by Marxists? Why is it that there they don't receive any wages for uh, domestic work in the household? Why is it that household um, work had been has been seen to be unproductive, not contributing to um, uh, uh, productivity? You can see too how this is linked to institutional political economy because institutions like the family, like the breadwinner wage, like the trade unions concern for the male worker, um, all of these institutions also kept women in their place in the home as domestic angels of the hearth. Feminist economics really draws on these issues and brings to light um, questions that remain relevant today. Let me begin with a preliminary note on language and gender. We will be using terms like women and men a lot in this particular lecture. And so a note on my use of language and gender is called for here. There now exists increasing disciplinary recognition in feminist economics, recent feminist economics in its entanglement with queer economics, with the work of Lee Badgett and others that we'll consider in week 11. There now exists increasing disciplinary recognition of the limits of binary definitions of biological sex and constructed gender. And we'll look at this briefly um, at the end of this lecture when we consider critical considerations in relation to feminist economics. In this lecture, following uh, Ross and Solinger's rec recommendations in reproductive justice, I acknowledge the contemporary need to use language that reflects a range of gender identities and the diversity of people's experiences in a context of rapidly evolving conventions um, but you will also note a strategic use in this lecture of terms like a woman and man that reflect significant, the significant historical role of these concepts and identities as they have played out historically uh, across the Victorian period into the early 20th century where traditional models of family behaviour were more or less accepted by economists, um, those who were recognised as economists, and where binary concepts were employed. And I do this both to understand the early theories 
uh, on their own terms. The concerns of the disciplinary feminist economists from the 1990s, the early founders of disciplinary feminist economics, um, and because we can't understand certain types of injustice uh, historically without using these terms. But when we get to the end of the lecture and we consider critical considerations of feminist economics, asking who wins, who loses and does it matter, we'll be able to um, uh, bring some of the more recent work by Lee Badgett and other queer economists to bear on some of the categories used by the early founders of feminist economics. Um, and uh, um, uh, acknowledge that their use of the term uh, woman and man um, have also reflected um, binary uh, biological uh, distinctions between sexes and on top of which gender is constructed. Um, ideas that uh, no longer reflect um, uh, uh, more recent scholarship um, on gender identification in its link to the biological. In our lecture plan today, we'll begin with a potted history of feminism in economics. And we'll recall our own approach to the material. We'll look at the problem that feminist economists assumed as their own, how they responded to this problem, and then we'll uh, apply a critical lens to disciplinary feminist economics too, asking who gains, who loses, and does it matter? Feminism came very late to economics departments. Although feminism had already come to disciplines like philosophy, cultural studies, English, history, and other areas, sociology, and so forth. Although feminism had already come to other disciplines prior to the 1990s, it wasn't until the late 1980s, the early 1990s, that um, the International Association for Feminist Economics was founded, along with the journal Feminist Economics, these were disciplinary means uh, by which economists could try to achieve recognition and rewards for their work within the discipline, allowing them to secure the institutional recognition for job security and for doing certain forms of research that hadn't been done before. This grew out of the labour economics of the 1970s. Uh, which had uh, studied, had been primarily um, undertaken by women and which had studied the differences in um, working life, uh, pay opportunities and so forth between women and men in the labour market in the 1970s. As per the uh, IAFI website, uh, IAFI, the International Association for Feminist Economics was conceived as a result of small group discussions at the American Economic Association Conference in Washington, uh, DC in 1990. Women economists found each other to discuss the difficulties in doing feminist work and their desire for conversation with like-minded economists. The session, Can Feminism Find a Home in Economics, attracted an overflow crowd many of whom became part of an initial mailing list of people interested in feminist economics. And then, as the website continues, a year-long collaborative process yielded an organisation, IAFI, and that was formally incorporated in 1992. The journal, Feminist Economics, was then founded by IAFI, in 1995 to provide an avenue for publishing feminist economics because the mainstream journals would not publish this work. Interestingly, feminist economics became classified in the early 2000s um, under the uh, uh, Journal of Economic 
literature, classifications, um, under the heading of heterodox economics, not mainstream economics at all. Even if there are now in economics certain types of economics that count themselves as feminists that clearly use mainstream neoclassical techniques, and we'll get to that in the methodology section of this lecture. But the origins of feminist economics as a heterodox school is likely the reason why many mainstream economists today even who do work on households, households, um, their behaviour um, and so forth, are often unwilling to identify themselves with the F word, um, pardon the pun. I'd like to begin with a short stage by stage account of feminist economics. And it differs with the way in which um, Stillwell presents feminist economics because he begins with the 1990s, really, with disciplinary feminism in economics. Um, but there, were, there was feminism in economics, in economic thought prior to the 1990s, um, even if the thinkers who undertook this work were unable to find jobs as economists. They remained economic thinkers and they have retrospectively been recognised as feminist economics in the history of economic thought, which is trying to recover the lost careers and thinking of these, these women. Uh, usually women were the ones undertaking this thinking. In stage one, from the late 1880s to, the 19, to 1918, we find activist material feminism in economics. Although this is not at all well known, there are a handful of scholars who have provided a history of activist conceptions of women's role and the role of the family in economic life. And again, this is not something you find in Steelwell's account. Um, his understanding of feminist economic states to the 1990s and not to this early period. In these histories that do exist, the odd occasional histories of these earlier feminisms, um, it's noted that there's a period of time from the late 19th century up until the interwar period where feminist, socialist and cooperative thinking had a big impact upon popular thinking about how to structure economies. For example, Edward Bellamy's Looking Backwards, uh, 2000 to 1887, published in 1888, was a bestseller and it developed an idealised account of ut the utopian socialistic city in which domestic work had been nationalised with cheap public laundries and nutritious public canteens. There was no housework. Um, there, was no, there were no domestic servants in this imagined Boston of 2000 that Bellamy imagined back in 1887. Families whose members were fully and com com compulsorily educated to college level were able to choose how they would contribute to the economy as a function of the strengths and interests of their members. This book reflected preoccupations of the time, reflected in both fiction and in scholarly tracts. Although Edward Bellamy was not himself a woman, a lot of this thinking was pioneered by women who recognised the need for overhauling the economic organisation of the late 19th century domestic life. We see this in novels by Marie Howland, Anna Bauman Dodd, Jane Sophia Appleton, Henry Orrich, William Dean Howell, um, Lois Weisbrooker and Eugene Richters, among others. A literature here, um, uh, a lot of it driven by women and their experiences and also in some work by um, imaginary, uh, imag uh, creative work by men. For a fine history of this period, see Dolores Hayden's um, 1982 book, The Grand Domestic Revolution which includes fascinating um, studies of designs for homes, suburbs and cities by architects, town planners and writers from across this period. 
So for an account of how these materials, material feminist and activist account of thinking compares with the non-feminist account of the role of um, families in mainstream market paradigm economics, um, look out for my book, which is um, in press currently with Cambridge University Press called Economics and the Family, A Social and Political History. Coming out later this year, I hope. It's in press now. So that's stage one, activist material feminism in economic thinking um, uh, from the late 1800s to the 19 to 1918, where socialism and cooperative organisation of labour was really debated as a realistic option imagined in these utopian societies. However, we then see in stage two a rejection of activist feminism in economics in a movement that I've called in my book the old household economics to distinguish it from the very well known and Nobel Prize receiving work by the new household economics from the 1960s onwards. The old household economics um, was uh, formulated in the interwar period primarily from 1917 to the 1950s. And the imagination of new utopian societies in which domestic labour was organised cooperatively and women no longer um, worked in the house um, in uh, oppressive conditions, all of that changed uh, during the First World War and the interwar period. A variety of factors coalesced in ways that led even moderate women's cooperative and self-help groups to be tarnished as communistic. And the factors included the impact of women working in the US during the war, replacing male, male labour with men at war, pent up demand of male workers returning from war who didn't want to be replaced by women, a struggle internal to the trade unions between men and women, with unions seeking to support men to return to work. One also sees the mass production during this period, the Roaring Twenties, of domestic labour-saving devices, which had commenced in the early 1900s. This gathered pace in the US, in the Midwest US, um, during the Twenties. And this is when um, remember in the institutional political economy that we studied last week, we saw that Veblen had criticised the consumption of the elite uh, uh, bourgeois families, um, the leisure class, as he criticised that consumption as invidious and as socially destructive. But now during the 1920s, we suddenly see labour saving devices and household goods being produced for the first time in factories in the US. And these were oriented towards low income families. So consumption, there was finally something for low income families to consume for the first time, really. Now, the war also had a further effect. War department propaganda tarnished even moderate cooperative women's organisation as, as Leninist during this period. These were the cooperative uh, feminist organisations that had been going into the factories when men were working at war to bring lunches, to, to cook shared meals for the women who were working in the factory so that they had meals to feed their children when they got home from the factory work. They were also offering cooperative childcare so that women could actually work. And this was necessary because the men were at war and the women were working in the factories. But when the men returned from, from war and uh, wanted their factory jobs back, we saw a period of social unrest during the 1920s and housing association groups uh, united with government to pioneer 
cheap lines of credit for workers to move from poor tenements. We saw pictures of them last week. Remember comparisons between the tenement accommodation of the working class families and the Queen Anne mansions of Veblen's elite. So the idea was to extend cheap lines of credit to workers moving from the tenements, working class impoverished, impoverished families, to new Midwest suburbs. And then they would be consumers of the very sorts of domestic labour saving goods that were now being produced in the factories. So we saw a shift towards increasing the consumption of the least well off with significant demographic shifts from working class to middle class within a generation. It was a striking change. Low income families could consume goods like uh, shoes, clothes, mass produced clothing for the first time, irons, um, fridges, fridge boxes, um, uh, laundries um, and so forth, internal laundries for washing clothes, things like that, in their uh, fully detached houses where labour at home became isolated instead of being uh, communal laundries in tenement working class tenement apartments. We now saw um, a fully detached uh, houses practical um, with their own internal kitchens and laundries and all of the domestic labour saving devices to go with it to allow women to do that work more efficiently but at home and not in the factories. This had an impact upon economics. Instead of being oriented to um, um, how how to improve the labour productivity of men in uh, factories in, in the newly industrial um, areas of Britain, we now saw economists focusing on, focusing on how to improve the consumption of families, how um, to uh, spend money wisely, to buy well, to how markets should be organised to serve the consumer, to protect the consumer against producer duplicity. Family economists in this period were primarily institutional, market paradigm economists like Hazel Kirk, Elizabeth Hoyt, Margaret Reed. They saw the market as the best institution for distributing goods to families. And by the 1920s, as I've said, there really was a much larger um, uh, market of goods available for domestic consumption of working middle class families, at least in the US. This was pioneered in the US and it took some time to extend across the world to Europe and UK. But these female institutional economists employed now for the first time in economics departments in the US in joint appointments between home economics and economics. They rejected feminism as activist. They wanted to distance themselves from that materialist socialist activist tradition that I mentioned as part of stage one. They instead sought neutral methods, quote, that would not take sides. They aimed simply to improve the consumption behaviour of families rather than correcting their internal gendered organisation in terms of who did the household labour. In the UK too, not just in the US, but in the UK around this period of 1917, although there wasn't so much of a focus on consumption, we still saw that Eleanor Rathbone accepted the traditional family structure when arguing in favour of family allowances to be paid to women with children. Rathbone had argued that the male breadwinner wage that had supported um, an industrial labour of men in factories in, the, in Britain actually hadn't ever been fully converted into family income because men didn't hand over their wages in full to the woman, to the mother. Children were vulnerable 
Women and children, Eleanor Rathbone argued, suffered from inadequate family income precisely because the male breadwinner income had allowed male independence. It had allowed men to drink at the pub in a late 19th century Britain. Um, it had allowed male um, uh, independence to participate in trade unions and to have other leisure pursuits. But women and children couldn't do, women couldn't do this. They had children at home to look after. And they also suffered from the effects of male alcoholism, domestic abuse, crimes of sexual violence, malnutrition and abandonment. The rates of desertion were incredibly high in Britain in the late 19th century. So this was a way for Eleanor Rathbone to argue to help women in their traditional roles, she argues this in the 1920s, um, women in their traditional roles to manage the problem of uh, male recalcitrance to hand over that money and to provide adequately and in a context of increased abandonment. In 1936, interestingly, her work affected Keynes, who convinced the UK Treasury to bring in allowances. Um, and he brought these, these were brought in um, to the post offices in Britain. Women could go and pick up their allowances every Tuesday. Um, Keynes thought this would boost aggregate demand um, and it would be cost neutral, he argued. It would pay itself off after five years with uh, the boosts to um, uh, uh, economic activity, employment, uh, tax revenue and so forth. So the main point here is that in this second stage, we see a rejection of activist feminism in economics in this interwar period, a uh, rejection of these um, the previously interesting ideas of socialist cooperative labour to organise household um, labour cooperatively. Um, and we also saw the War Department black uh, red listing these moderate feminist activist associations who'd been so instrumental during the war and, tar and tarnishing them as Leninist in a context of um, um, the Red Scare, Red Scare number one, because there'll be a Red Scare later in this, in after the Second World War too. We also see a rejection of activist feminism in economics um, become particularly acute in the 1960s to the 1990s. And this in a way gives rise to a, a reaction. This is what really provokes disciplinary feminism in economics. It, 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 it really makes it necessary to bring feminism back into economics in the 1990s, the net late 1980s. We saw the rise of the new household economics. And these economists like Gary Becker, Jacob Mensah, Theodore Schultz, they attempted to explain the role of women and families by extending economic rationality to such um, behaviour. Again, rejecting activist feminist conceptions. And Gary Becker relied on sociobiology, um, on the literature of people like Edward Wilson, who'd argued for um, uh, that sociobiological difference in animal in the animal world was, was um, could explain why there were gender differences in the animal world. And Becker did something similar in the social world. He felt that the comparative advantage of having children would allow we would make it rational for women to choose to um, invest in household labour rather than market labour. So this was a rejection of activist feminist conceptions. I've included an optional reading by Gary Becker this week. Um, it's optional as it assumes 30 micro, but you can still skim it to get a sense of the argumentation involved. It's framed, in my view, as an attempt to explain why the post-war uh, welfare state and later the war on poverty were not viable. Demographic changes, lower fertility rates among those who are more educated, meant that there were less young people in comparison to older people in advanced capitalist democracies, and a fear that welfare states would not be able to raise a revenue from taxation to sustain an ageing population. And there was also um, the context of 
the civil rights movements linked to the war and poverty in the states in the 1960s, which had invested in community empowerment strategies, uh, which these uh, new household economists rejected. New household economists sought to explain the fertility decisions of families to invest in the human capital of, ex of existing children in terms of the economic rationality of those involved. That sounds compl complicated, but it's just really the idea that women or partners are going to decide to have less children and they're going to have less children of greater quality, more educated, and they're going to prefer that to more children of a low quality. And the implication is that families should be responsible then for the welfare of their own members so that they enjoy and suffer the results of their own decisions. Um, and they, they become responsible. Um, uh, Becker describes Malthus, again, like Marshall did, as having one of the first modern conceptions of um, population and change and fertility. Have a look at Millian de Cooper's fantastic analysis in family values between neoliberalism and the new social conservatism for this idea. So that is again part of stage two, um, a, a later version of the rejection of this activist feminism and economics. And so stage three is really where Frank Stilwell begins, but he misses out on this absolutely fascinating history that really hasn't been told until my book. <laughs> so um, in press, if I didn't say that before. <laughs> so if my reading is correct, then feminism came late to economics almost as a reaction to problems within economics and not as one might have otherwise expected as a response to the demands of the social movements of the 1960s and 70s. Although it was also linked to that, obviously, and certainly it was. The studies of labour market economics by women in the 1970s were about why women weren't working as much as men, um, what their education levels were, um, what impediments they faced, why their wages were lower, um, why they were segregated into certain forms of occupation that had lower wages, all that stuff. But it was also a reaction to problems within economics because there was a view that the new household economics had really pushed to, to one side the problem of gendered inequalities as an injustice. Becker and others, Gary Becker and others, had rationalised economic inequalities between women and men as if they were mere outcomes of rational choice. But the feminist economics of the 1990s wanted to reject that and say, no, we have to see gendered inequalities as injustices that need to be changed and not facts that need to be accepted as rational choices. So the main problem to be discussed further in a moment is gendered inequalities in economic outputs and outcomes. And Gillian Hewitson's book, Feminist Economics, and she actually studied at La Trobe under Professor John King, um, identifies two different responses. I really like her book. There's firstly the add women and stir or feminist of equality approach, also referred to as the gender neoclassical feminist economics. This is committed to the normative goal of overcoming gendered economic differences. And these guys, try, these economists try to show that the new household economics approaches of Becker and others had ignored or actively undermined the important moral goal of understanding how economic conditions had disadvantaged women in families and how this disadvantage might be overcome. So the ideal was gender irrelevant markets, no significant difference between the market behaviours of individuals on account of their gender. The idea was that mainstream economics just needed to be corrected by explaining and overcoming gendered differences now positioned as in injustices. But then there was a, another type of feminist economics that um, was formulated that was quite different to the feminists of equality. These were the feminists of difference. And the aim really was to see, um, was not really to see women's behaviours and experiences as objects of discrimination or to try to achieve a market 
without any significant gendered differences in economic outcomes, but rather to show how the understanding of women's experiences was distorted by the very methods that were producing the disciplinary knowledge. And there was a there was a movement within this second approach to value the work that women did as a kind of economics of provisioning, responding to needs, where economics itself became, became about provisioning in response to needs and not about uh, a rational choice or about increasing production or um, and so forth, increasing efficiency and so forth, but about provisioning, about responding to needs. And the work that you're reading this week falls across both of these two different categories, indicating the diversity and heterogeneity of feminist economics. So that was the history, as I've told it, well beyond the shorter history that Frank Stillwell tells, which begins from the 1990s onwards. I don't think we can do that. I think we have to start earlier if we want to understand feminist thinking in economics and why it became marginalised and why it came, why it returned. Now that we understand that history, we need to understand, we need to ask the question, what are the problems to which feminist economists have sought to reply? And again, that's the first stage of our, our three pronged approach, the problems, response and critical considerations. So there were two quite different problems, and I referred to them um, already at work in the book written by Gillian Hewitson. The first is the problem of why, well, whether gender differences in economic outcomes exist, why they exist, and how might they be overcome. A first type of feminist economics that I've referred to as equity feminism or equality concerned with equality. But then there's another problem. Have our understandings of women's experiences been distorted by the very methods that produce the disciplinary knowledge? The idea is that so far neoclassical economics has understood human behaviour as a rational choice subject to constraints, budget constraints of time and income. So that women are seen to choose and make choices about investing in household cap, uh, human capital rather than market relevant human capital. And also um, uh, where household labour has been seen as unproductive, as, a, as the backbone for the productivity of labour in industry. And the idea is that these approaches to women's experiences have distorted our understanding of this. Um, so the problem is the distortion of our understanding. It's a methodological problem. So to say a little bit more about this, um, we see in a first stage the add women and stir approaches. A first problem is to, to elucidate, to, to actually show the existence of a statistically significant economic inequality between women and men. That's the problem. Gendered pay gap, gendered poverty gap, etc. And you see this in the text that you've got to read today by Gillian Hewitson. Um, as part of this equity feminist approach concerned with equality, we also see the problem of statistically significant economic inequality between, interestingly, women and women, not just between women and men. And for this, we also turn to Gillian Hewitson's text. We see life expectancy gaps and different earning capacities between women of different backgrounds and locations, and this is depicted as a problem. So economics here is elucidating and illuminating this problem and trying to manage it and what should be done about it. And then this second approach, as I've mentioned, instead of being concerned about inequalities as a problem, the problem is um, conceptualised as um, uh, problems with method, problems with the dominant neoclassical method and its application, problems with microeconomics, how to explain the relation between price and economic behaviour, 
Uh, this depicts economic behaviour, including undertaking unpaid household labour as a result of choice, not as a result of social norms, legal institutions or other forms of power. This is uh, an idea that you, you will see in your text by Julie Nelson. And then there are problems with macroeconomics, how to measure the production of wealth as GDP and its relation to other economy wide phenomena like inflation, price levels, unemployment and so on. And the text there for you is um, uh, Marilyn Waring, Rhonda Small and Gillian Hewitson. Um, they argue that um, household labour has been excluded from national accounts on the basis that it's unproductive. It's excluded household labour from employment statistics as well. This is simply the idea, for example, that if I go to the shop and I buy um, infant formula to feed my baby, that counts uh, as part of productivity. It counts as part of the national accounts. But if I breastfeed at home, that doesn't count. And yet that is a big contribution to economic life, understood as provisioning. Um, and yet it's not counted. So we'll see efforts here to count that sort of activity, um, the value of that activity in various ways. Let's now look at the response from feminist economists. Well, first of all, they analyse these disparities much along the lines of the previous slide. And then they try to explain why these disparities occur and what to do about it. Let's look at Australia as an example, analysing these disparities in Australia. Well, the Australian government publishes its own fact sheet about Australia's gender pay gap and its feminist economists who have done it. The gender pay gap is the difference between women's and men's average weekly full-time equivalent earnings expressed as a percentage of men's earnings or expressed as a dollar figure. Note that the gender pay gap is not the same as equal pay. Uh, it's not that women are being denied the same rate of pay as men for the same occupations, because actually that's illegal. It's illegal to pay women and men different amounts for the same job. And also the pay gap, the gender pay gap, is not a comparison of the pay of women and men across like roles. Um, the gender pay gap is rather a measure of the difference between the average or median pay of women and men across organisations, industries and the workforce as a whole. So it's showing that institutional um, opportunities for women are significantly reduced at the level of the economy um, so that um, the lifetime average earnings of women in comparison to men are much lower. So the gender pay gap is influenced by a number of factors, including discrimination and bias in hiring and pay decisions. Women and men working in different industries and different jobs with female dominated industries and jobs attracting lower wages. It's influenced by women's, women's disproportionate share of unpaid, unpaid caring and domestic work. A lack of workplace flexibility to accommodate caring and other responsibilities, especially in senior roles. Women's greater time out of the workforce, impacting career progression and opportunities. The effect of lack of sleep. Gee, my first child was a bad sleeper. I used to come to work and nap on the floor to be able to then work any productively. Gender pay gaps are an internationally established measure of women's position in an economy, although due to differences in sources, definitions and calculation methods, they are difficult to directly compare across countries. Gender pay gaps in favour of men are a common feature of, world, of economies worldwide. Here I've put the way in which uh, Australia's gender pay gap is 
calculated. And I've provided you with a website where if you head over to that website, you can actually test yourself to see whether you understand the gender pay gap, uh, the concept of it in different scenarios. So head over there and, and see how you go. So the gender pay gap is determined by looking at the average earnings of men and by taking away from that the average earnings of women and dividing that by the average earnings of men and multiplying it by 100 to get a percentage. So you get a percentage, of, um, you're able to then um, uh, uh, reflect um, the difference between men and women's average earnings. In Australia, there are two gender pay gap data sets. There's the annual workplace gender equality employer census. Um, that's released in November and it comes from the annual employer census. Um, under the Workplace Gender Equality Act of 2012, non-public sector employers with 100 or more employer, employees have to report on a range of indicators, including, including employee remuneration. So the data set includes the remuneration of employees working for employers with 100 or more staff. It uses total remuneration, including super, overtime, bonuses and other additional payments. Um, and that what's, that's what makes it different to the second method. It includes full-time, part-time and casual employees, which the second method doesn't use either. And it excludes the salaries of CEOs, heads of business, casual managers and employees who were furloughed. And the results of this for 2023, I've updated um, this to reflect this um, year's findings, the most recent findings. The total remuneration average gender pay gap was 21.7. It's been going um, down. The gap has been decreasing, um, but not enough. So for every $1 on average a man makes, women earn only 78%, uh, 78 cents. Over the course of the year, that difference adds up to, just in one year, $26,393. So the Australian Bureau of Statistics survey of average weekly earnings um, does something different. So economists using this measure will calculate the national gender pay gap using Australian Bureau of Statistics data. And um, this data shows a gender pay gap of only 11.5%, um, but it's calculated differently. This data set doesn't exclude, doesn't include overtime, bonuses and additional payments from which men disproportionately benefit. And it doesn't include the salaries of part-time and casual workers who are disproportionately women. So it doesn't capture the sort of fuller picture of the first type of measurement. So the second empirical problem is not just the economic inequality that exists between women and men in an economy, but the economic inequality that exists between women and women. So economists have sought to establish and elucidate this as well as to consider how it might be overcome. This is something that again comes up in Hewitson's text, who points out that economic inequality between women and women is as significant as domestic differences between women and men. Within countries, one sees racialized differences between women with migrant and low socioeconomic women in low paying jobs, the race gender pay gap, the intersectionality of oppression where racial discrimination heightens gender discrimination. Now we've so far um, explained how economists, feminist economists have tried to articulate the nature of a problem of empirical inequalities between women and men and between women and women. But they will also articulate theoretical problems with dominant neoclassical approaches to understanding women's behavior in families. And so the second branch of feminist economics 
the one that contests the very methodology used by mainstream economics, um, actually points out that the problem is microeconomics and its assumptions and methodologies and findings. And so we'll see that uh, the response will be to develop different sorts of methodologies that are um, plural and that see economics as provisioning in response to needs and not just about understanding rational choice subject to constraints of time and income. So um, uh, the feminist economics, uh, the feminist economists have pointed out that approaches that are neoclassical like Gary Becker's have depicted, particularly um, in his family economics um, and also in Theodore Schultz's family economics in the Chicago School of Economics, um, this rational choice approach to understanding women's behaviour depicted economic behaviour, including undertaking unpaid household labour by women, as a result of choice and not as a result of social norms or legal institutions or other forms of power. We get this idea in Julie Nelson's text. So, for example, let's consider briefly how new household um, economists explain why one partner chooses to specialise in unpaid household labour, with the other partner choosing to specialise in paid market labour. Gary Becker won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1992, in part for using neoclassical techniques to explain this. For Becker, a gendered division of labour is driven by three factors. The first factor includes gains of specialisation and gains from trade. Even if men and women are identical, he said, even if we assume they're identical, just pretend they're identical because he doesn't think they are, specialisation and trade would still drive a division of labour, he said. As soon as one person in a relationship, um, this is an assumption of um, uh, uh, a couple, a uh, heterosexual, primarily heterosexual couple, although it could be extended to um, non-heterosexual um, um, relationships. Um, uh, th th the idea is that we can explain why one partner will choose to specialise in market labour and the other in household labour by virtue of uh, the rationality of specialising in the area in which you have, the type of work in which you have a comparative advantage and in which you begin to invest human capital in. So if you, you know, might, might have an interest in cooking and you might invest some time and energy and human capital in learning how to cook well. Well, as soon as you've done that, that means it makes sense for, that, for you to specialise in that with somebody else to do something, another task. The second factor is that comparative advantage associated with biological difference um, creates differing opportunity costs for certain activities. So he states explicitly, there are differences between men and women, presumably related, as he puts it, to the advantages of women in birth and the rearing of children. And this leads women to have a comparative advantage in the having of children, which makes it rational for them to invest their human capital in household labour and home production rather than in market labour and in wage-based employment. And the third factor for a gender division of labour is marketplace discrimination, which increases the, um, the uh, uh, rationality of choosing to specialise in household labour, um, increasing women's, um, increasing the costs of women's market activity relative to men. Um, 
he says even a small tiny little bit of marketplace discrimination will then make it rational for women to invest in human capital so this is a rational choice explanation uh, human capital relative to households so this is a rational choice explanation of why women rationally choose to um, um, uh, work in the house rather than investing in market relevant human capital and working for a wage now feminist economics feminist economists were ups were reasonably upset with this because it tended to present these outcomes as mere rational choices and not as injustices and they wanted to say no these are injustices In one of your texts for this week by Marilyn Waring, um, an influential New Zealand economist and politician who uh, developed a way of counting women's labour and its value, she points out that um, uh, mathematical formulas assist the illusion that economics is value-free science our propaganda, she puts it, is less easily discerned from figures than it is from words. To view value as derived from scarcity, utility and desirability is itself not objective, but a specific moral and political viewpoint. So if you're making a, if you conceptualise as making a rational choice subject to budget constraints of time and income, scarcity of goods, a desire for utility, then the outcome of your choice is then seen to be rational and if you choose to invest in household labor under those conditions well so be it but she wants to say that that those assumptions then produce the illusion of the decision as free it doesn't deal with it doesn't see these economic inequalities as injustices the basic definitions and concepts in the male analyses of production, she writes, and reproduction also reflect an unquestioned acceptance of biological determinism. Women's household and childcare work are seen as an extension of their physiology. I've carefully studied Becker's book on family economics myself and noted that he draws heavily on the work of Edward Wilson, a sociobiological account of gendered behaviour in the animal world. This is in the 1970s that Edward Wilson wrote this, and it was in part a response to um, the women's and uh, sexual liberation movements who were arguing that gendered differences constructed on top of biological difference were actually arbitrary and contingent social constructions that could in, in principle be changed. And Edward Wilson was arguing that really no gender differences in the animal world were an effect of essential biological differences. And he, want, he suggested that you could see the human social world as a reflection of sociobiological difference. He clarified later that he didn't intend to really put it like that, but it's uh, clear that this is um, quite um, uh, an ex a potential extension of his arguments and critics um, made that point at the time, that it served to oppose the objectives of the women's movement. And Gary Becker draws on this to develop his ideas. In the text you read by Julie Nelson, we also see her mentioning similar problems with the neoclassical approach. The neoclassical approach, quote, reflects a narrowing of the definition of economics that reflects particular gender related biases. The economic approach, as Gary Becker refers to his methodology, is commonly used to mean viewing a problem in terms of choice, individual uh, welfare, in terms of profit maximising choices of autonomous rational agents. And Nelson argues that what becomes of lesser concern is an idea of economics as provisioning, there's no concern any, anymore about whether people are able to get what they need. Rational choice under constraints is all that's important for the neoclassical economist, according to Julie Nelson. So we now turn to how feminist economists in the 1990s, the late 1980s onwards, responded to these perceived problems 
Remember, the problems were conceptualised by the feminist economists as the empirical problem of gendered inequalities that were injustices, and as a theoretical problem where neoclassical economics were presenting these gendered inequalities as outcomes of rational choice. Um, rather than seeing um, economics as concerned with provisioning in response to needs. And so the responses align with these problems. The responses are first to try to use economics to identify the constraints that will be, need to be changed if we're to overcome gendered inequalities. So we'll see people like Shoshana Grosbard arguing that if we understand bargain, if we understand the lesser outcomes of women in divorce processes, the fact that they get significantly less in divorce processes, if we understand them as a form of non-cooperative bargaining, then we can consider, well, how might we want to change the institutions that constrain that bargaining so that better outcomes for women in general become possible. The second view is to see economics as about provisioning in response to needs and not about mathematical modelling, where the latter is just one part of the story. And this is the sort of view defended by people like Nancy Folbra, Julie Nelson and others, where the idea is both about how to count the value of what women do, Marilyn Waring, and also about um, how to uh, design institutions that um, uh, ensure that uh, children do um, uh, get enough food, that they have a good education, that they have access to quality childcare and care um, and so forth. Um, and that, yeah. that women are protected from the sorts of domestic abuse that were, were an effect of the male breadwinner wage, um, high levels of crimes of violence that were an effect, as Griffin has shown, of um, the increased alcoholism that resulted from male independence linked to the breadwinner wage. All of this is to view economics as provisioning in response to need and not just economics as a rational choice to explain why women might choose their subordination freely. So the first approach, the account that actually tries to look at, well, how might we elucidate those constraints and then work to um, uh, understand what elements of those constraints might need to be changed to achieve better outcomes? Well, this first approach actually does rely on neoclassical models. It doesn't eschew them. It doesn't reject them. Neoclassical models have played a major role in feminist economics, particularly in the equity stream of feminist economics. So we see, as I mentioned, Shoshana Grosbard, and you can follow her on Twitter. She calls herself the economist of love and does some really interesting work on um, the lesser outcomes that women um, um, uh, unfortunately experience as an effect of um, uh, constraints on the bargaining processes that they need to, in, that, that they um decision processes are inevitably constrained by. Barbara Bergman too, although she criticised Shoshana Grosbard for relying too heavily on Gary Becker type models, Barbara Bergman herself uses such models. She uses such models to try and explain the lesser outcomes of women um, in receiving lower wages in segregated um, uh, areas of employment, the pink ghettos um, of, you know, childcare work, aged care work, teaching, nursing, these caring and educative employee employment um, areas that receive low wages. Um, 
And this too is about how to, if we want to achieve greater gender uh, pay uh, quality, um, how might we change those institutions to achieve that? Uh, Claudia Golden, who won the Nobel Prize for economics in the last, uh, very recently, um, makes certainly draws on neoclassical models. And Lee Badgett, the queer LGBT plus economist that we'll look at in the week on queer economics in week 11, also relies heavily on neoclassical models to explain why um, uh, why uh, non-traditional families uh, experience higher costs in having children than um, traditional heterosexual families and how this might be overcome as well. This account is called Gender Neoclassical Economics and it, in certain versions, can be feminist. Not in Gary Becker's version though. The second approach is associated with that idea of difference economics, difference feminism, not equity feminism anymore. And this contests the reliance on neoclassical models. And we see the proponents being Julie Nelson, Nancy Folbra, and so on. Here we find a rejection of the idea that economics is about scarcity. And we see instead the idea that economics must be about provisioning Economics should be centrally concerned with the study of how humans in interaction with others and the environment provide for their own survival and health. And this means that the objectives and methods of this second approach are different to the neoclassical approaches, although some of the latter techniques may still often be helpful, statistical, empirical analysis to research how people empirically respond to incentives can be useful. So as for examples of other responses that fall into this second approach that can test the theoretical model of neoclassical economics and its ability to explain and overcome gendered inequalities in economic outcomes, we find Marilyn Waring's attempt to count the value of household labour in GDP measures in satellite accounts. Um, this is the idea, for example, that the value of breastfeeding at home which does not count as part of GDP, should still be counted. And the question then becomes, well, how do you value it? So there has been work done in terms of uh, thinking through what methods might be appropriate forms of evaluation. Should we value breast milk in terms of its equivalent on the market, infant formula? Or should we value it in terms of the investment of the woman's labour in breastfeeding? The, the salary, let's say, that the, the, the value of that labour in terms of a salary of, of a type. So there have been efforts to try to specify, well, how can that, might, how can that be valued? How can household labour be valued? How can um, we value how much the work of a woman at home doing the laundry is worth in these satellite accounts. But still even now this means that macroeconomics, which is the study of GDP, its definition, how it changes, how its changes affect inflation and employment and how the government can manage it, it still continues to exclude about half the economic activity that's actually being undertaken because this still only appears in satellite accounts, this work. This is a significant limitation on policy making. Feminist economists have also sought to show how gender matters for policy efficiency as well as equity. So it's not just efficiency, but it's not just equity, but efficiency. Studies of developing countries have been undertaken, which have shown, for example, that reducing gender inequality in education enrolments, um, uh, the labour market or time burdens leads to rises in productivity, national income and economic growth. So to summarise, how have feminist economists conceptualised the problem? Well, uh, they have conceptualised the problem in terms of gendered inequalities that can exist empirically um, in economic outcomes between women and men and between women and women.
Also, they've conceptualised the problem as theoretical, problems with the dominant neoclassical approaches, rational choice subject to budget constraints of time and income, and how these have misunderstood gendered inequality as rational choice when it should have been understood as injustice. There's also been problems, um, according to the feminist economists, with how economists have calculated GDP, which have excluded a significant amount of the productive activity of an economy. As for the response, feminist economists responded by trying to uncover these inequalities through empirical studies. They proposed methodologies and frameworks that repositioned economics as provisioning in response to needs and not as a rational choice explanation of behaviour. And they tried to count the care work that takes place in households, which has been wrongly viewed as unproductive and lacking in market value. Let's now turn to part two, who wins, who loses and doesn't matter. So who benefits? I find it hard to answer this question given the diversity of feminist economics with economists having studied um, how to improve the lives of care workers in particular industries, um, women at home looking after children, um, and a whole range of different identities. But we can say more broadly and quite obviously that women benefit um, as defined by the theory. We look at this more closely in the week on queer economics. Um, so um, we look at how the early feminist founders of economics conceptualised women and gender in a, a particular way um, and how this became criticised by queer economists like Lee Badgett, who also identify as feminist economics, uh, economists. Um, women from minority backgrounds also benefit from this approach because um, the concern is also between about differences in economic outcomes between women and women articulated through the lens of the effects of race on gender difference. But this also means that men benefit too if there's a lens on race and its intersection with gender difference. So men from minority backgrounds would also benefit. And the most sophisticated arguments take the view that everyone benefits, even those who appear to lose. As for who loses, well, in week 11, we'll explore arguments from queer economists like Lee Badgett, um, who um, has just finished up a, a term as president of the International Association for Feminist Economics. Um, and we'll explore her arguments um, to the effect that early feminist founders of economics assumed the very same idea of binary biological difference between women and men that Gary Becker had used to reject the claims of the women's movement. So the idea of overcoming uh, gendered differences with gender difference positioned as a binary construct on top of binary biological difference has also been problematized by queer economists acknowledging how queer gender identities um, have also experienced differences in economic outcomes in health, um, employment, in the uh, distribution of um, uh, um, vulnerability um, and so forth. Um, and this, these, um, the argument is that these two can be viewed as injustices. Does it matter? Well, if we want economies that t try to overcome injustices, then it does. Yes. So we'll explore that more fully in week 11, where we will look closely at how Lee Badgett um, uh, tries to pursue feminist economics while enlarging the defining category of who counts as a woman and what the objectives of feminist economics should be. We look forward to seeing you in Tutes this week. Um, and this is just a heads up that um, after the tutorial in the week that follows, um, 
it will be mid-semester break.